this book feels like something I would have been forced to read. Yes, college. correct. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly what it feels like. Everybody's faffing about how great this book is. And I'm like, just because you just you said there's a city where there's a multi ethnic racial caste divide. You're not smart. That took three sentences to say you do not need to write a book about it. And I think that's a lot of what people liked about this book is it just brings up an idea. And if you bring up an idea, oh, wow, you must be a visionary. You must be so smart. No, this is like people who like banter and academic books you know why they like it because they themselves are not funny so they think the banter is oh funny. god there's so much ire this is people who are not smart reading a thing and being like oh my god no that's not true you're being a little heated I'm mad hello everyone welcome to another episode of unresolved textual tension i'm trying to be proper this time on the intro and not screw it up by missing anything <laughs> Today, I am here, my name is Katie, and I am here with my ruggedly handsome co-host, William. Hey guys, what's up? I'm extra rugged, extra handsome today. Oh my God, so cheesy. And the book we're doing today is The Saint of Bright Doors by, we just struggled with the name. He's a Sri Lankan uh, author, so it's Vahra Chandrasekhara. And that's me trying to pronounce a Sri Lankan word like it's in Spanish. The backstory behind this book is a little bit interesting. So one thing you have to know about me is that I am very insecure in my reading tastes. I often feel like I'm trash, but I don't want to be trash. I want to be like high literature. And so every once in a while on this podcast, um, we try to read a book that's more real literature. Um, and I have one reviewer uh, who I really respect, uh, who has really good opinions on movies. And so I assumed she would also have really good opinion on books. And so this is the third book of hers that's supposed to have been really good that we're um, trying out. The first one was The Book Eaters. The second one was She Who Became the Sun. And now we're doing this book. And um, this is all to say that I have now realized everyone but me has trash taste in books. Katie, what okay. did you think of this book? I've thought a lot about this book. Uh, so when I say this, I really mean it. I have like contemplated, I've had shower thoughts on this book and what I, <laughs> how I feel about it specifically. And like, number one, before I say anything, this book I really should have read visibly and not listened to. Um, although, like, I can't say I disliked the audiobook necessarily. Like there wasn't anything wrong with it. I just, there is a lot of like double entendre metaphor stuff. And I feel like you almost have to dissect stuff. Like if you don't read one sentence, you might actually both miss and not miss anything. Um, but also, uh, 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 before you say anything. And um, so I'd like to premise with that. However, that being said, I have two distinct feelings on this book. One, it is incredibly well written. There are so many little bubbles little pockets throughout the story they're like little i told maria yesterday it's like oh look a pretty bubble and it's like floating by and it's like wow it's so beautiful and unique and then it just keeps going though and then you never get to like actually like the bubble doesn't do anything it just goes it doesn't even pop in front of you it just keeps going and so i think this is a beautiful book i think my second distinct feeling is that it is all over the place oh my gosh i cannot it does not have a proper story structure. And I know, I know you could say, oh, well, like maybe that's the Western style I'm talking about with the different arcs and stuff. But no, even then, like we don't have character arcs. We don't have characters that we can follow that have meaning that make a lot of sense. Uh, and biggest issue, there is no follow through with stuff that is built up. OK, I need to foreground this conversation by saying that I think this book is terrible but it does not necessarily induce the rage in me that a book like Song of Achilles did. To me, this is more just a nothing of a book. It's so much nothing. And just, I feel like it, it, it makes me more angry at people who think it's good than it does at the book itself because the book is so much of nothing. Um, and I uh, actually have a few uh, things to quote, both from our patrons um, and uh, on the Discord, and also from the book itself in terms of prose. And I think there's two main problems with this book. The first is that the pros aren't good. They're in a literary mode. And sometimes I think people misconstrue a literary mode of writing with a good road of writing, or that's a better mode of writing than like other ones. Um, and in this case, this is an example of bad literary mode. There's a lot of abstract language and there's a lot of like 
just saying the thing. It's incredibly telly. There's a, a real lack of... Um, I know you said there was one metaphor you really liked, but there's not a lot of them. I want to contemplate this for a second, though, because this is interesting. So do you not think that the language is beautiful? Like, is it is it that you cannot appreciate, you don't think that the language is beautiful, or that you don't think that the sentence by sentence by sentence, like, and how they come together is like so not good. I think it's both. I think there's a lack of- Wow. I, I think in a, a literary mode of writing, there's a lot more introspection and there's a lot more of a, a telliness, like a, it's a person in an armchair telling you about somebody's emotions. But usually that's counteracted by like a lot of genuine wit. Maybe that's like a funny wit or even just a, okay, I'm, oh wow, you described this thing in a way that I had always felt but never felt. Or you bring it in a different perspective and then you're like, exactly. oh, I get what that scene did. Or it's like a little funny, and but in this book, that not none of that is really the case. And again, I, I brought a few. I would say for the majority of it, like it doesn't, it doesn't have the zing of certain other. I can't think of any good ones, and I haven't been able to since yesterday. But there are some literary books that really bring kind of a wit and zing to things. You know what I think the problem is there. I think one of the biggest issues is there's no cohesive. Like it, it's it's really like a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, where you uh, take different pictures and you put a collage. It's like a like each page is a collage of like socio political like analogies uh, or like uh, or um, uh, what are they called when you allude uh, illusions or whatever illusions illusions uh, illusions to other things. Um, there's like a, a fantasy like multi dimensional thing on each page. There's like his like actual character that's not much it's and then like all of that is shoved in each page through a lot of pretty language that does not come together well but there's little like i said pockets that sound good it's true and the thing is there will be moments that are really good the opening to this book is fantastic um and there are ideas in it that work really well there are even moments i think that work pretty well but overall this book is extremely um distant and unspecific in its actual world and and story uh one thing that i know maria said she had told you was that um you can have elements of your book be floaty and abstract but in terms of plot character or theme you need to have one of those that's really solid and engaging and this book has none of the three none of the characters are that interesting or feel that real the plot is completely like cul-de-sac -y and it just goes in different directions and the setting is really floaty and not particularly real what do you mean by cul-de-sac because i like the way you say that but i don't know why you know another thing i often say is that clocks don't have gears they don't oh my god shut the which you mean <laughs> no what do you mean genuinely what i mean is that it starts a bunch of plot lines sometimes it will finish the plot line but the plot line won't mean anything yeah it's like a cul-de-sac you just go in a circle and it like it brings things up and then never am and this is one of those books because i did read some um people complimenting it um, because I actually wanted to do a takedown, um, but I'm not gonna say specifically who these reviewers were or anything like that. And basically what I gathered, and I'll get into this in more detail later, but this is one of those books that's bad at being a book, but the point of it, but then people argue that, oh, it's being a bad, at, it's bad at being a book on purpose. And by being bad at being a book, it's telling you something or making you show something. And like- Not in this case. I don't think so in this case. I could be completely wrong. I mean, I'm not the end all be all of like understanding literature, but from what I have experienced, it, this is missing traditional storytelling requirements in order for it to be a good story. And I really like, ugh. so my favorite character was his mother. His mother was fantastic. I'd really like to discuss his mother at some point. And specifically the scene with the door at the um, Agustav uh, thing. And uh, when it opens and his, you know, we'll talk about that later, but, um, that whole concept and then the world building and everything, I loved it. I really, really loved it. That was one little grain of sand <laughs> on like a massive expanse of desert of concepts in this book. It's like, it's just a couch with threads everywhere. A cat has come along and scrubbed all the freaking threads out and it's just a fuzzy couch now. And I don't want to sit on a funny, a fuzzy couch. I like, I get itchy. Like there's probably cat dander everywhere. Anyway, the point is. The springs hit you in uncomfortable places. Oh my God, the ending, William. The ending. <laughs> like I, I get the ending is supposed what, to like- you didn't like murder Shadow Dick? 
<laughs> dude, when I wasn't expecting, so I don't. Stupid. I get thematically what it's going for there, but it's just very stupid. All right, really quickly. Um, Lindbergh said Margaret Atwood, Donna Tart, and Kasua Ishiguro write uh, literary fiction with what I think is more effective prose. Yes. yes. So me and Katie, I uh, have decided that the next time we do one of our critique live streams, we're gonna go over good literary writing versus bad literary writing. But Katie. When I say you and I are going to go over a critique oh live stream of good versus bad literary books, what am I talking about? Is that a video that appears on this channel? William's doing this really mean thing right now to me where he, but also simultaneously, he's like dadding me. Okay, so we have a Patreon. And on our Patreon, we have different tiers. One oh, of our tiers oh, is the Parasocial Darling tier, where William and I take a look at a piece of literature in some way, and we technically try to understand it on a higher level. Um, hopefully we want uh, you and as well as us, because we often learn things from this, uh, to enjoy it and also learn alongside us. Now we also have other tiers. I don't know what the F they are. Please, William, tell them. <laughs> Parasocial Darling tier that Kitty was talking about is one where you get uh, your name in the credits at the end of the video and you get access to these uh, live streams where me and Katie really look at pros. We've had some really good ones. I find them actually super useful to just sit down and find out the specific thing. Beneath that though, there is the book club tier which is what this book is it's um once a month or twice a month we have a live stream for a different book uh with the mid-month book which is this book uh i pick i'm sorry and um you guys all get to be along for the ride but the one at the end of the month is um one that is picked via poll uh you guys nominate books i pick five of the nominations and then through they win you get to decide a fourth of the books we read through the end of month book club and then below that we have another tier where if you're just you know if you're not interested in those two other things maybe you still want to be part of a discord with cool and sexy literary people um and if you do we have one that you can join at that tier and honestly if you don't have any money because that's very common in today's capitalist hellscape you can just like us on youtube and leave a comment to engage the algorithm so that way we get positive things happening on our youtube so we can continue to make this content and enjoy one another's company apparently katie does not want to get paid for her labor from that tone of voice so oh, i so bear that in mind when we are <laughs> picking <bad>. only <laughs> when we are okay i'm sorry i'm sorry sorry make sure to like and subscribe viewers and that way you can get part of uh, our community even more and uh you can even tap that little uh bell so that way you can get notifications when new things happen on our youtube <laughs> right so before we go further into criticisms of this book do you want to try to do the plot or I can do the plot or the basic the basic premise? I want to try it and I want you to do it because I'm curious okay. how different it'll be. Okay, so this is a story about a young name, uh, a young name, a young man named Fetter. And he is in a world completely unlike ours with a history completely unlike ours um, where he has to navigate the expectations of his old world mother and decide whether or not he is unfettered from his father a near deity named the perfect and kind or whether he is going to fulfill his mother's destiny for him and kill him and that's not even the book that's not even the book <laughs> even though that's what i'm pretty sure the premise should be like that's not the book. Uh, no, the book beyond that then continues down a rabbit hole of philosophical, sociopolitical, religious musings uh, in different settings. Will, your turn. Okay, so I actually think there's two things that can... That was not bad. That was quite good. Um, but I think I'm going to quote the Goodreads um, oh, okay. premise because I think that actually helps. Uh, Fet... Okay, so this is the other thing. The main character in the audiobook is called Feta, and it's, it's spelled Fetter. Fetter. So I don't know, and that's why I say he's a very cheesy protagonist, at least in the audiobook. What do you mean by cheesy? Feta is a type of Greek cheese. Oh, oh, that's actually a really cute joke, and I'm really upset I didn't catch it. It's cool. It's cool. I told it to Maria earlier, and she immediately got it because she was very Greek. Um, all right, so uh, the good reason is, Feta was raised to kill. 
honed as a knife to cut down his sainted father. This gave him plenty to talk about in therapy. And that is very much the style that you think this book is going to be. You think it's going to be an urban fantasy where it's like, oh, the modern world with like um, uh, interacting with more fantasy concepts. Like, you know, one of the things is that Fede uh, and his new city goes to a support group for people who were not chosen by their god or like fell away from their religious path as a prophet. Um, and like, this is just a thing that happens. And you're like, okay, this is a really cool vibe. We can do this. Um, and then the book decides not to do that um the the book starts with fetter just say feta his mother pins his shadow and strips it away from him when he's born um which you don't think which throughout the entire book i was like what is the point of that and eventually it kind of has a point no but that could have been done so fun oh yeah i mean that's another thing is that like it, it's it's not the, the, we'll talk about the twist that's not very good at the end of the book i know i i told maria i called it the twist not twist it's so stupid no but there's a lot of really fun concepts in this but it just yes. i don't understand they're not saying anything better was raised uh to be an assassin by his mother who they only ever call Mother of Glory, um, to kill his father, who is a prophet of like occult religion. Um, and he is raised from a young age to do this. And you would think that this would be, and again, this is one of the concepts that the book is like, hey, this is gonna be really interesting. What's it like being Never uh, is raised used. as a tool? <laughs> Never used, not once. I don't even, I don't understand why certain things are highlighted. like. I, this book also starts off, it makes you feel like you're missing something, in my opinion. Like, it made me feel like I missed the first book about his teenage years when he was an assassin. And also, that assassin stuff, like Will just said, it, it's 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 built up like it's haunting him. Like, it's a big piece. Like, it's built up literary style. Like, it's going to come back to haunt him. And it doesn't! Later in life, because we almost immediately switched him later in life after the first chapter of Prologue or whatever, and he's just, like, mopey. He's not, this is not, okay, so this is, <laughs> again, the thing about this is that this book is really floaty and abstract in every regard, and especially in Feta. He is not really, he does not feel like a real person. He feels very distant, and a distant character can be okay. There are still ways to make uh, a character who is distant feel vital and interesting to the reader. Um, Garth Nix does this in a lot of his books I've talked about before, but this book, like, doesn't pair it with, nobody talks really like a real person. They all kind kind of talk in a like very distant like not there, there's no like little grounding conversation so like he has a boyfriend um and like we get told in the narration how they're falling in love and then about like a fourth of the way through the book they finally get one scene together and then they'll get one more scene and then that's it like there's very few like in scene moments and so Feta um just feels very floaty and insubstantial. And like, somebody is gonna say that that's the point of his character. Because he's the shadow thing and everything. That's fine in some regard, but it there, you can't, there has to be an arc of some sort. Like that never comes, like what's the point of having it? If it's not going to in some way matter, especially with the amount of screen time it gets, it would be like me filming a fly flying above a beer bottle for like five minutes in screen time on a movie. <laughs> and like, that's money, baby. Like, but not money for, you know, the writer, but that's what it is basically, right? That's going to be this entire video is us going, hey, this is a really cool idea, but it doesn't go anywhere. And then the immediate response is going to be from people being like, well, it's the point is that it doesn't go anywhere. And then I'm going to have to point out like, no, A, this is a full length novel. If you were just going to have an idea, just tell it. I mean, like, you know what? Honestly, if this was a short story, I'd be like, okay, that was kind I'd of be weird more accepting. pointless. But, I'd yeah. be more accepting of it. On the Discord, Lindbergh, shout out Lindbergh, had a good way of explaining this. Here, let me find. Okay, she had said, so she was talking about avant-garde. Well, speaking in terms of avant-garde, it gives us something that we know and then turns it into something unexpected to make us think. This book gives us a ton of things we don't know, flips them upside down, and then leaves a bunch of strands floating in empty space. And that's kind of the thing about it is that like, I get that the point is to make us question, because again, I read some good reviews of this and like they were even talking about like just describing it makes it sound like it has problems, but that's the brilliance of it. No, and it's like, I don't know about mm, that. I, I don't think so. Again, so for example, with his character, there, there's a, a continual problem where because things are never very established very concretely, you cannot contrast, the author can't contrast that later with things feeling amorphous. 
So there's never a point where, so they're going to talk a lot in this book about how the um, city is very much defined by cultural layers of race and class or caste, right? They're, the city's obsessed with it. It's um, written down in all these books. People will treat you differently. You can get different jobs based off of your race and caste. And they're always like, and it's a complicated ex uh, melding of these. The book will never once ever concretely explain what the races and classes are. Like that, it, 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 every once in a while be like, ah, and then it was from the old empire Luriat. And that's it, but it's never really defined. And you can tell because the book in its language doesn't ever just explain, tell you what the classes are later on. It will just continually refer to castes and races. But okay, so wait, if I were to argue, let me play devil's advocate for a second. If I were to say that, but if those details are, I'm just curious. So, because I know there's a loophole in what I'm about to say is why I'm saying that. Mm -hmm. um, well, devil's advocate. The thing is, the devil isn't right about things. I am. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What if I were to say that, and since those, the actual races themselves, like, that's not necessary for the majority of you to understand the plot. What would you say if I said that you don't need to go into that or anything mm -hmm. like that? I would say that would be fine for a short story. But I would also say that that makes it harder to then contrast that um, the amorphous, amorphousness that the book is trying to evoke later on less amorphous and more like, well, th this was this whole thing was always amorphous. This is this is the normal. So it's it's hard to have moments of loudness. Are you talking about how like the world changes later? I mean, partly, yes. And then also, like, if the point is that, like, the city is tangled in its um, different race and classes that don't mean anything, really, then like that would be an interesting thing to explore if we actually understood it. Uh, and what these concrete things are. You mean like if it was treated like an actual story rather than a metaphor? Like, because it's like, no, no, yeah. what I, I mean, it's like a symbol. Like, it. that's why I said to you, remember what I told you before? How it like dips into like Mother, like the mm -hmm. movie Mother um, uh, with Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, it's like it, everything becomes less a story and more like a symbol to like represent something else. And, yes. uh, but, but the problem with that is, is it's mixed in with characters that are obviously written in a way that we're supposed to care about like a traditional story. Well, okay, so maybe not. One of the reviews I was saying was saying, ah, and then that's the part of the brilliant mm -hmm. reveal at the end is that this character never mattered and he was supposed to be aimless. And that was the point. And no! it's like, fucking no. <laughs> that's not the way it had been written though. Like there were really important scenes. Like there's this one scene where he sees a young version of his mother, his mother's pyre scene. Like there was a very obvious, like, and then like his interest his romantic interest in his boyfriend and then like his issues with pipra which is a woman that he has a slight attraction to like it's all very much like there's too much detail in that way where we're supposed to care about these characters where and it's not like it's uh, uh it's a gradient of storytelling where it's like oh yeah normal traditional story slowly transitions into metaphor yes, exactly. it doesn't do that cleanly it's like it would have been so much more effective if it had and that's yes. the thing i think because there's a switch about halfway through the book where suddenly the plot goes in a different direction than you oh expected. my god <sighs> and i think that's what he was trying to do but it's not effective because we the, the first half of the book is built up in a way where this city already feels very very amorphous the plot stakes are real low the character is not an interesting character you expect there to be this really interesting like okay he was raised to do one thing and he loves his mother but he can't do that now and that's never played with ever um and so it, it, it's very frustrating that this book uh, well okay i think this book would be so much more effective if it had actually been a good story that then played with being yes. amorphous versus yes. just being an amorphous story from the from the word yes. go. Yes, that's what I really, I mean, that would have been really cool, especially with the concepts, because there's one particular concept that happens, um, which is the idea that, um, so Feta's mother comes from, uh, spoilers, Feta's mother uh, is an old world citizen, meaning like, you know, like she's like tribal, they have no names types of things, like like the true core of humanity type of thing. And mm -hmm. they interacted with like Mononoke slash Junji Ito-esque devil things. They, they weren't called devils, they were just other people at the time, but then later on religions imprinted and called devil, blah, blah, blah. But the point is I'm gonna call them devils um, because Feta does throughout like the whole mm -hmm. book. 
Um, so, like, she comes from this old place and she was, like, a pearl diver and that's kind of cool. And then she was, like, a lesbian. <laughs> that's kind of cool. Then, uh, Big Daddy Long Dick comes along and he's, like, a uh, Western representation, I, it, even though he's not, although it feels right. that way, certainly. I mean, this book definitely has a colonialism stamp on it, which I like, but it's, like... I, I should say that uh, I was also reading an article talking about this book in the context of uh, the recent kind of explosion in Sri Lankan's uh, speculative fiction. Ooh. And I think that's what a lot of people liked about it. And one of the things they pointed uh, out was mm -hmm. that, like, there are it is a very interesting world. Violence comes from religion in a way that's very r normal for Sri Lanka, but not here. So that's not a thing we really expect. There's a lot of co there's not like one patriarchy. There's a lot of competing uh, systems of uh, oppression and privilege, all kind of in flux with each other. And that's one of the things about the city he lives in, Luriat, which is the main setting, is that like he's constantly there. Everyone's constantly making jokes about who's in control of this. There's like a queen and a king, but there isn't. And then there's, and like the whole thing is it's supposed to be amorphous. I love that concept. I, I thought it was good, but I do think it's overly abstracted at times. It's better explained than the races and classes thing, but it's not, it's still a little amorphous and it's more played for like a joke. So the, the example that Maria gave was Confederacy of Dunces, which is a book I was supposed to have read and then didn't because I was in college. Um, and in, in that book, that book also has a very si similar satire of society and bureaucracy and how like dumb it is. But like you're grounded in the main character, you're invested in what they're doing. And so that becomes so much more of a potent combination storytelling technique. Yeah. And it becomes such a more potent uh, um, criticism of that kind of, of bureaucracy and stuff and, and societal movements because you actually give a shit about what's happening and this isn't all just going to be pulled out from under you. There's that message in this story, which is a heavy, heavy message that is constantly reflected upon. But then there's also this really cool fantasy-esque idea, which, so his mom, Island, Big Daddy Long Dick, um, which is his father, um, comes over, steal, basically goes around and is like readily accepted, steals the magical knowledges of sorcerdom, um, and like asks the devils. And I, there's this really cool concept where it's like his mom says at one point, we never asked the devils like how they did things or, you know, what they were, where they came from, because they weren't something to be studied. They were just a being to interact with, which is a really cool concept. And then you have the newer sciencey version of things, which is what his dad brings to the island, which is like, uh, tell me the science of how you do this. So that way, basically, I can do this too. But anyway, the point is, yeah, he wants to he wants to formalize everything into a system, including society, so that things can be worked out well. And like, she's just more pagan hippie, where it's like, yes. Dude, what you talking about? The the ganja. That was awful, and I apologize to everyone of every uh, race, creed, and religion for that impression. <laughs> um, but it's very, like, that kind of vibe, um, which I did think was interesting. I did, too. I really liked... So, Dad... There's de other details that happen. But Dad ends up learning something, uh, learning a lot, and ascends in a way, and becomes the quote-unquote perfect in kind, um, which the line where th the origin of that comes from is really sick. I really liked the way it hit. But um, he actually rewrites history, but the way it's described is very cool. It's like he rewrites geography and history, and it's like, and so everything that was is now changed, and it's like all these, and Fetter is born in this era, but because time and change has happened, he's like century year old, centuries years old, centuries years centuries. old, um, centuries old. Um, there we go. <laughs> I really should have said that. Um, he's centuries <laughs> old, okay. but he's also not. And there's also yeah. a lot of things that exist that like sh shouldn't exist, but Fetter should exist because he's from the original reality. So it's like a really interesting thing. Yeah, when his father changes reality, it retroactively changes things in the past. And there's one interesting time this is used in the book. Um, also, all this information Katie is saying, we only find out about halfway through the book. That's like when the book starts. And so that idea of shifting history to change things is fascinating, but it's also, again, another thing the book doesn't really go into that much or even play with. Again, there's one thing in the middle that it does kind of. But the first half of the book is him in the city of Luriat after he has run away from his mother and he's just homeless or he's not homeless. He just doesn't work. He lives in public housing, which like doesn't make sense with the city. 
as a whole, but the whole point, as the review was saying, is that the city doesn't make sense and is contradictory, so I guess... Oh. But it doesn't make any sense with the city as a setting, which is, like, deeply classic. Yeah, by the way, everyone, we still haven't even gotten to the title of the book. Bright Doors? There are bright doors in this. So we have got, like, all of that time travel Willy Wonky stuff. We've got the different cast and uh, political structures and then Sri Lankan history. That will never be fucking really explained. And then, uh, William, please continue with the city itself and then introduce the bright doors. The city is, like, very corrupt. Um, there's a lot of, like, um, oppression. It's They're constantly mentioning programs and uh, plagues that are used as, like, and riots that are used as ways of hurting the lower class. Um, uh, which again is just never super explained, but whatever. Yeah, I was just confused of the logistics behind it a little bit. Like that's uh, it, the thing. The logistics of this book are real weird. It's so you know. Oh, did you watch Mother? No, I know what happens in it. Though. Okay, so there. If you remember ever seeing a, a reference to this scene, there's this one specific scene where I was like, "Oh, it's a metaphor." I mean, I kind of already knew it beforehand, but like, there's this one part where. The main character's in her house, and it's, like, pretty normal, but, like, these quir quirky things are happening. And all of a sudden, there's a riot in her home where, like, it, but it's because it's literally yes. slamming your face into the metaphor. So, literally, this normal woman in a normal house suddenly has, like, it, the scene almost changes, and it's, like, a literal riot back and forth. And people, and there's fires, and homeless, homeless people, and sick people, and then people being, like, chained up. And I'm like... Oh, it's a metaphor. And that's when, like, when that started happening between all the different um, uh, religious orders and, and cults and stuff, I was like, okay, so this is like doing that where it doesn't actually have any deeper meaning. It's just representing an idea. <laughs> well, it is the deeper meaning. The deeper meaning is uh, right there on the surface. But in this case, there is no deeper meaning. And also, this book would just explain to you the metaphor and skip the actual metaphor party, but just tell you the thing the metaphor is supposed to show. So uh, Chantel makes a really good point. Um, and it, it is unfortunate. She says, too bad Maria's not here to sing us the Too Many Things song. Many so Katie, things. you're up. I don't remember the tune she does it to. Too many things. I think it's how she does it. Perfect. We need it for a, a gift for the um, Discord. Um, again, join us on Patreon. Um, okay. And so the thing with the city is that, like, they're, they're, okay, so, again, he's at the support group. Which is also a thing with uh, other people who are, like, it, and it's, like, teenage animation show style where the therapy is a whole bunch of, like, different people with powers uh, because they're not... Chosen, chosen. Uh, I didn't quite understand that, honestly. <laughs> okay, so again, this is like one of those moments of uh, like urban fantasy that the book Sora has and then r r gets rid of later, which is like, okay, he's there because he was supposed to kill his father but turned away from the path. There's another uh, lady who like was uh, was trained as to be a prophet, but then her brother took over, so she's like bitchy, like salty about it. And then there's another person who keeps giving visions to people of what their a prophet is going to do but they aren't the prophet and like it's a cute idea but it's like it, it's never really explored because again this book doesn't explore anything on the point of it. um so uh in this with the old lady who was supposed to be the prophet but then her brother took over she is like um uh she is kind of like fomenting a revolution to destabilize the city so that like she, okay, so this is the problem. This revolution plot line that, that that Fetter will become a part of, and not even really a part of, but just kind of go along with, because nothing in this book is driven really by his actions. He just kind of floats from thing to thing. Um, it's never really, again, explained exactly what kind of oppression they're talking about, because it's just against, like, lower classes and programs. And, um, and it's never really explained what her plan is, like, what's she going to do about everything? And this will drive the first half of the book. <laughs> Which sorry, is wild guys. to me. <laughs> like, I, it's so much of it just doesn't really, it is really not explained well. And like, I know I'm not great at explaining things sometimes or remembering things, but it really, even at the time, I remember being like, why is this a plot line? Why should I care? I'm not invested in any of this. I'm not invested in the characters. I'm not invested in their plot. And I'm not invested in this setting. And everything is just kind of meandering. I really liked aspects of Fetter. Like, as in literally, I liked certain things that happened in a specific moment and what his reaction to the thing was. I really liked, but I didn't like him, you know? Um, no, there's actually, there's a couple of banger lines, though, in this. Um, like, there's one, I wanted to mention it before I forget, and I was trying to 
find. I really should have just freaking written it down. The but one about the sign? No, what I meant is what I really when I realized how hardcore the author was going for that vibe is when he was like, oh, the company's uh so when he goes to prison, there are street signs, and the street signs are like things like he almost can't even read. And then he realizes it's because it's a whole bunch of acronyms for all the com- like the companies and the businesses that gave money and donated to those specific areas. And it was like, oh, consumer, I get it, capitalism. <laughs> like, I, I got it, like I understood. But anyway, um, no, there's this one really banger line uh, in particular, and it's like, ah, and it's, the I can't remember her name, it's because I always got it confused, but her, she's the one that's the theater troop leader. Yeah, the revolutionary old lady. Yes, yes. The one that I was um, talking about before that's salty. She says to Federer at one point, like, God, I wish I could do it. Fame is the way the law keeps artists in place. Yeah. And I really liked that line. No, I thought that was a cool line. I thought that was a fun take on it. So, okay, again, this is the thing where it's like, it's okay to sometimes be a little telly if the telly thing you're saying is sufficiently interesting in, again, either a funny way or a a new thinking about way. Um, and because it's through dialogue, it actually feels that particular line feels less telly than it, the other ones. Part of the problem is that a lot is just literally told to you through narration. Also, because I want to make sure I mention this, it also becomes very anime at one point. I, am I wrong? Like when Magellan, a character, is like... Yes, it is very across, anime. And I'm like, oh my God, it's like Bleach. It's like there's like an and these like people have different superpowers because we're mostly at that part in the book and mostly because I just want to I, I, I feel like this is probably a good time to do it uh, I'm going to share one of my screens this is a um, one of the quotes from the book I think there's a paragraph break here somewhere but anyway this is him talking about his boyfriend this is by the way a lot of what me and Katie do when we're doing the critique streams you should join uh, it's actually quite interesting that Maria isn't here for this because that's too bad I know it. Well, too bad or too good? Okay, so this is where he describes his relationship. His connection with Hedge becomes more and more intense. Federer isn't sure when things segue from dating to relationship exactly. At first, he tried to stick to dating, a concept he learned in late late in life from film and television. Mother of Glory scorned such things as disruptive technologies inimical to spiritual growth and a consistent training regime in what he understands to be its classical southern southeastern imperial style. Ooh. Style. Dinners and incomprehensible theater performances and brunch and such like, followed by sex and post-coital tension. God, that is a long sentence, bro. By the way, also, I noticed when you read this, it's less bad than when you listen to it. For some yeah, reason, it feels a little that. less telly when you're reading it, and I'm not totally sure why. It's be- No, I knew that would happen. It's because this is meant to be read. This is the type of thing where each line, you can't skip a line because it contains so much information. Okay, fine, whatever, continue. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, so like, okay, so for example here, this is cute, followed by sex and poised coital tension. Like that's like a, oh, okay, I thought that people have thought that before, but they've never said it. Ha ha, it's a little witty. It's okay to just say the thing. But after the first, first few weeks of attempted formalism, their interaction dissolves into a pool of complex organic reactions. The coursing of his heart becomes too wild to ignore, so much so that Fetter begins to worry it's audible from without, finds himself talking louder and faster to try and drown it out. Hedge responds to his animation in turn, and the sense of excitement of over-oxygenation spirals. The air is too thick, the blood is too rich, too red. Um, so this is all we're going to get about their relationship, and it's like so telly i'm sorry read what shannon says incomprehensible (laughs) theater performances people in glass houses shouldn't throw (laughs) stones that was so on point holy (laughs) but notice how like this is so telly and the language isn't great so complex organic reactions uh, i like that line actually i like it it's because it's like it's it's a fun little like different way of saying oh it was all preconceived at first but then like it became more organic over time i don't know it's fine no it's not it's um it's it doesn't explain what these reactions are i originally read this organic reactions as in like hormones and i thought oh that's kind of clever like they're getting closer through the biology of whatever but no organic here just remains means like their actions springing one from the next it's not a particularly interesting way of saying that and it doesn't make you think of it in a different way the coursing of his heart becomes too wild to ignore so much so that begins to wear from afar hedge responds in to his animation in turn 
abstract animation is so abstract and intern is like just the look, most look this is such abstract language i don't want to be told you're correct I, I if i were to actually <laughs> care about this i would prefer to be portrayed in some way and then it could be summarized in other areas but if i'm gonna be told it's pretty good language i think this no. is pretty good language all right you and i are gonna have to take this to the critique off when we do That's it as our critique stream um because i uh, i this to me is not sufficiently good language to it's fine like i think it's i think it's clean i it's it's oh it's bombastic and a little superfluous i will say that this part of the book is not as bad as later parts in the book about it mm -hmm. uh, what i also really wanted to focus on here and why i picked this one in particular um is because this is all we're going to understand of his and Hedge's yeah. relationship yeah and this is why him and hedge don't feel like real people. You can't get invested in the relationship. You can't even get invested in him because this is not how real, like this is such a bird's eye view. Yeah. Of like, like if you're a hawk circling 500,000 feet above the earth, that's more or less how much like we understand him as a character. Somebody's going to argue at this point, but wait, William, cause the twist that not twist is that when Fetter is a child, his mother does a ritual and takes his shadow from him and rips it off him. And, um, <sighs> yes, and we'll talk about that it, stupid twist it, later. It, it never comes up again, but one may argue at this point that, hey, William, but it's from the shadow's perspective and he only comes in and out throughout the story. So of course it'll be distant from a bird. That doesn't make it, it's not structured in a way that supports no, that. Yeah, we'll talk about how bad that is. But um, here, let me go back to this really quick because the other thing I wanted to talk about was... Oh, yeah, sorry. This is another one later and I think is a better example of the telliness. So he's describing weaving together banana leaves or coconut leaves into like a basket. What he's oh, making this, yeah. is a seeming pot. The art of the coconut leaf is about semblance, a magic of sympathy and evocation. Everything made from them is a seeming, a mimicry of a real object that evokes its symbolic function in a fleeting biodegradable form. A seeming and cannabis evokes shelter without providing it. Seeming spear evokes protection without the capability of for violence. Seeming fences represent boundaries without enforcing them. The seeming pots then represent fullness and containment. They are placed in a grid, reinforcing each other around a site to declare it temporarily sacred. Ground zero of a marriage, for example, or a funeral. This is the most telly shit I've ever read. He's literally just telling you the symbolism of a thing. This is so lazy. Me and Katie were looking over the Scorpio races the other day and we talked about how in one of the horror scenes, the author is able to give you such a strong sense of the 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 terror in the moment despite never describing the character's feelings or the character directly like thinking of them like you you were just able to get it through osmosis of the descriptions this is not that this is him telling you telling you the symbolism of the thing give me a moment give me a moment Formulate. i understand no 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 i understand what you're saying and you're not wrong but if this were in a different book being utilized so imagine okay listen imagine i literally cut this out and it existed in a different book in a place that it fit this is very well written i love the concept being explained here i think it's a clean explanation does it sound like it came out of a research paper yes absolutely does it actually enhance this book does it actually do no it's another very complex co concept that's being shoved in a tiny moment when something else big is about to happen and it's slowing down the tension and ruining the story so to salvage our friendship let me say a few oh my god you're so lame one this is how he talks all the time like that's, that's the, the thing problem. is that first example i but gave you're actually problem. kind of right it's not terrible the first one with his boyfriend or whatever but in this case, this is much closer to just him just telling you a thing. Yes, Miss Sally Snow. That's exactly. It feels like something I would have been forced to read. Yes, college. correct. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly what it feels like. I hate it. Everybody's fapping about how great this book is. And I'm like, just because you just you said there's a city where there's a multi ethnic racial caste divide. You're not smart. That took three sentences to say you do not need to write a book about it. And I think that's a lot of what people liked about this book is it just brings up an idea. And if you bring up an idea, oh, wow, you must be a visionary. You you must be so smart. No, this is like people who like banter in Akatar books. You know why they like it? Because they themselves are not funny. So they think the banter is funny. Oh God, there's so much ire. This is people who are not smart reading a thing and being like, oh my God. No, that's not true. You're being a little heated. What they're, I can see what they're appreciating in this. Um, I, uh, no, look, I don't dis, uh, look, I understand your, your view. I'm not, necessarily against you framing just, can change a ton i think the skill and the ideas in this book should be lauded 
I think the concepts that are attempted, I don't think it's a good book, but I think the concepts and I think the writing in a lot of places and I think the way, like there's this one description of a, uh, I don't remember what it was, but it was like, a, it said something about a rainbow being on a bubble and expanding and it was just like a beautiful image. So there's a lot of gorgeous imagery mm. in this, but it does not come together at all. I wouldn't say a lot. There is occasionally, but this is not like one of those literary writers where it's like, Oh wow! Okay, every sentence is hitting. This is no, like every no, once no, no, in a no, no. while. That's, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I just you said, said filled with. It is filled with. There are many one-liner hitters every now and again that are really good. I didn't say that every line filled was with now and again. <laughs> to me, feel like opposite. It's a novel, William. <laughs> no. It's a longer. If it was a short story, again, maybe, I, maybe I wouldn't say yes, that. Yes, if it was a short story, again, I would. Ju I would. Bringing up an idea but not fully exploring it in a short story to me is, okay. is fine. It's it that is fine. If this whole everything that happened in this book was in a short story, I would be like, actually, that was really kind of interesting. It was messy, but I'd love to see this expanded into a book. Yes, yes. No, that is not what we got. This no. idiot rambled in our ear for an hour. And well, you know what's really half, twelve it, hours. It's really, really upsetting me though that there are some characters that seemed particularly important and like they they really. Like, I was invested enough in, like, I guess, like, the, the certain, like, aspects of the world. Like, so, for example, the world building in, uh, and I kind of am a little angry about it. Like, I feel cheated um, because the world building of the history of his mother and that entire chapter of his mother was, in fact, let me just say, I'd rather just read a book about his mother. Yeah, she's such a more interesting character. And also, mothers are so underrepresented in fiction. It's such a fascinating inherent power to raise someone else and the themes you can tell through that and how world shattering that people that is like those are yeah. immediate buy and stinks to, stakes to how you're raising your child um no but this book had to instead be about stupid feta the cheesy man um chantel says okay. will's having song of achilles yeah. flashbacks yeah it's like I'm ptsd a little bit. i just i hate pretension i hate i know i know you do it, when it's not. it magnifies your ire i know um oh. so the but the thing is is like I, I i think one of the so in essence there's some really fun interesting world building there's a couple really fun really interesting dynamic descriptions and like maybe metaphors and like concept ideologies and concept brought up but it's like it i know you don't like food metaphors it's okay i'll love this is it. kind of like um we had this one restaurant in the area that went out of business um and it was called dats and when you went to Dats, everything was bombastic. Like, you couldn't just get, like, a normal club sandwich. The sandwich was made out of waffles, and then you got, like, a steak, and then you got, like, bacon on it, too. And then, oh, whipped cream and a cherry and sprinkles. And then on top of that, candy, like, like chocolate drizzle or something. You know, something like that wild. Um, but... Each of those, that's not quite the right metaphor because each of those things are very delicious. And I wouldn't necessarily said e each of the things that are brought up in this book are delicious. <laughs> but like, it's kind of like that, you know, they're just too much. They're genuinely is too much going on i think that's actually a problem i think bringing something up and then not but i think that's in kind of enraging in a way that if you hadn't I brought it up <laughs> i said i got angry over oh, okay all right i felt like there was so much so a great example very key basic there comes a point where fetter has a phone call with his mother and all that story is revealed Prior to that moment, the story was very much framed to be like a young adult sort of like, not young adult, but like a young person, uh, young adult structure. A blue where Roman. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. It's the term for like a coming of age story. Yeah, a yeah, building yeah. Uh, is what it felt like what was happening. And um, then all of a sudden it suddenly shifts into this like, it's not high fantasy, but like this very, very massively different world with deep, lore and then it jumps from like his mother's pyre scene which i love but it's bizarre um mm -hmm. his uh mother's pyre scene onwards is just like massive amounts of just blur it, it literally is a blur yeah it becomes a fundamentally different one for the record this is the word i was thinking of oh yes uh, buildings Bil roman buildings roman is yes. it growing up or coming of age of a genuinely naive person? Um, okay, so no, I agree. It, and it becomes a very different per thing at the um, midway point. One thing I, I do want to say about 
subtlety is that the, this can exist on sort of a spectrum. So one of the examples I used um, and one of the places I think I, it's just most clear is um, in a book called Vampires of El Norte, which is not about vampires. And uh, it makes me um, angry that, well, it just makes me ashamed to be Hispanic while I was reading it because it wasn't very good. But anyway, at the beginning, there's one point where the main character, he like, he couldn't go into the Casa Mayor. He couldn't cross the threshold when he was young because he didn't dare. Um, and then later he has to do it to help the girl. Um, and like, the book pauses as he's about to go in and this is like a moment in an action scene and he's like and years ago he couldn't do it but now he can because of blah 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 blah, blah. and it's like that is to me is way too on the nose and people thinking about symbolism in the moment another way you could have done it is he pushes in and then later in, in a moment he goes oh wow i didn't even pause or i didn't stop like i did when i was younger and that's like a way of kind of showing a little bit less that, that's being a little less obvious of it or you could even have it where he doesn't think about it at all and readers could be like See, it's secret symbolism. So there, it does. Yeah, like it, in like hills, like white elephants. Yeah, exactly. Where it's really like, oh, the threshold is about abortion. Um, and so like it can, these things can exist on a media on, on a, a gradient, and how much you are okay with that versus not okay with that has a lot to do with the framing. Um, and, and also just you personally as a reader, there's again an Overton window. Um, but like I think this exists so far outside of what's a reasonable expectation of being told things and told symbolism that's what maria literally that is literally almost verbatim what maria told me as her final thesis for this piece of what she had read so <laughs> far um also i wanted to uh mention there's also like these weird moments and it really like it massively took me out of the book where uh, and I thought I, I gave it like grace too for a moment after the first two times where I was like, oh, maybe this is going to get at something now. Um, so there's this one scene where he's like turned on by a door. Oh, God. Do we have to talk about the nipples in this book and how much the author talks about his nipples? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. So I don't like the description. It's like it literally says and plug your ears if you don't want to hear it, you babies. But his like penis fluttered or something like that. But I don't like that. It's like penis and then it's like out of nowhere there were no there was no sexualization no sex scenes or anything like that and that happens twice one when somebody touches his face and and i'm like oh maybe it means he's touch starved and it's like gonna go into something i i tried to give it the benefit of the doubt but no and then also later on like and then yeah and he touches his nipples looking at a door yeah there's a lot of talking nipples later on he mentions his balls tightening or whatever and i just uh like i don't understand why authors are so weird it was so wild though in particular like okay so at this point we're uh you know we aren't we haven't there's too much stuff to really go over the book we're just discussing chunks at this point right actually actually hold on hold on here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna describe the plot really quick because you actually have to leave in about a half hour i want to i want i want to describe the plot please can i try uh, i'll do it I will i'll do it you, you do it in three minutes and if you can't do it in three minutes i'll do it in three minutes okay start okay, a timer go. uh okay oh geez as part of the group meetings Fetter uh meets other people and he's trying to like create a uh community for himself there and he meets several characters that are introduced to us that seem to hold some importance and significance to him and there are many scenes afterwards where they are brought up especially this one character gardo or uh, I, I don't think I'm saying that right, but that's I'm trying to imitate the dude's name. Um, but uh, so there's a lot of really interesting characters being introduced. None of them go anywhere, um, but it's tugged at your heart as a cheap tactic to try to say, oh, they're in danger at like some points. But anyway, um, so Fetter it gets. Uh, yes, Fetter uh, it becomes part of like the whole rebellion thing and he decide and he takes on a, a fake identity, Petra. And um, he goes to study these things called Bright Doors. These things called Bright Doors have magically appeared in the last little bit in Luriat, the city he's in. And they don't know what it is. Nobody understands where it goes. They can't open them, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they just happen over time. Doors magically, if you leave it shut long enough, might turn into a Bright Door. So anyway, he studies them. And it, in fact, all these doors are being studied by like researchers. And there's like this whole like system of trying to figure out like the scientific meaning, like higher enlightenment of what they come from. And Fetter realizes there are openings to different dimensions and much later on we find out they're opening to dimensions that have been like wrote over um like time being written over and they're people from other places and these monsters that are around that he sees these devil things everywhere and they're kind of like Jinji Ito like things so they're pretty cool and fun sounding but anyway um but then simultaneously we're being told that he is as a teenager the assassin thing so that comes up every now and again we skip all the way to his mom ptsd episodes call him conversation gets closer with mom uh dad 
the perfect and kind uh, one among many cults is about to come and he ends up giving in at one point and thinking, ah, yes, I am going to kill my father. He steals this relic, which is his mortal tooth. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to use this tooth to kill him. And it's because all I have to do is be within 80 miles and it will kill him. So he gets on this train and he intends to kill him. And then he goes to see his mom and his mom is dying of cancer. But now she's on her pyre. She's literally going to burn to death. Well, she's dead, basically. And she's like, nah, he ain't dead, son. Like, he just overwrote time to where he was never near the a tooth in the first place. And Fetter's like, okay, great. So what's the point? And so anyway, he goes on and then we go into dreamscape. He gets arrested. He gets thrown into this prison. That's not a prison. That's just a really big marsh. And then he gets picked up again. And his father finally takes him. And his father is like, mm, perfect and kind cult leader person. And Fetter like gets stuck in the city. It's a new kind of prison. Um, and he's constantly being watched. And all of a sudden you realize that reality itself is just a giant prison and everything really sucks. And there's like no happiness. His friends don't even like him. It's because he ran away in prison because he was like oh poor me i suck which honestly yes fetter you do um and uh then uh perfect and kind uh tries to win him over to his side and be like yeah you can be my heir and he's like i don't really want that and then all of a sudden out of nowhere fetter shadow comes out and he's like yo it's me it was actually my perspective the whole time I exist separate from Fetter all this whole time. And Fetter gets brought to this dimension where there's only light and no shadows. And so he couldn't go with him. And then that's uh, because the perfect and kind brought him there. It's because he didn't want the shadow for some reason that we're not told. And I don't really understand why the shadow matters all that much. But anyway, Shadow's like, yo, I don't like feeling trapped. So he travels into the brain of the lover of the perfect and kind. And as he's giving head to the perfect and kind, slithers into his balls and hides there. And then slowly kills him like a cancer on the inside until he's finally dead and then we are left in the middle of a riot scene between all the factions in the city where the uh, shadow's like yo peace fetter you suck and that was it okay three uh, minutes and 45 seconds pretty good um that was actually very nice um yeah so the thing about it i realized as you were saying it is that uh, let us just say now shortly there's so many dumb plot cul-de-sacs that happened during this period yes. like you're not gonna get this because katie linked them together and skipped a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter like him wandering a, through a massive camp. massive amount of stuff there's a bunch of chapters of him wandering through a camp just being like homeless and like you think this is gonna lead to character growth and it doesn't he's the exact same person at the end there's even like a weird arc where it's like he becomes sort of like a witch doctor because people keep telling him to be one and then he gets like a devil off of a per off of a person i like that scene no it's a cool scene and it's a cool concept but it doesn't mean anything he doesn't change no. as a character he doesn't act differently afterwards it's just like that happened no he literally becomes more pathetic as the story goes on yeah and it's it's and, and like not in an interesting way where he's like been beaten yeah. down and realized there, there's two things that are interesting about the story one is the idea that when you change things they change or when his father changes things it changes them retroactively so like at one point he meets in the prison yes science fantastic wait a second yes while the father was being blown <laughs> the shadow was hanging out in the back cortex so of his one dude and they're both old men too and the old one old man is like that's giving head is like a really like gross sniveling little creature of a dude and the perfect and kind is like uh, you know a gross cult leader dude so it's like he's like yeah but you don't know he's giving head so it's like and then as the dick slipped out of his mouth i was like ah! he's like i curled around his gonads or something i knew it was gonna be that because it's so so stupid like and i get the symbolism of the good and the kind and like his blind spot is that he thinks the body is disgusting because he's a christian stand-in and oh so i'm hiding in his balls the one place he wouldn't look all right whatever cool dude um, this does not mean more thematically. This is not like the underclass is rising up in a way that the upper classes can't see them. That was one of the, the metaphors people said about the book was that really the book is about how like, you know, the upper classes are blind to the lower classes because they don't have to be. And But it's like the shadow is not a lower class. Literally, the reason he kills the good and kind is because the good and kind sees him at one point and he doesn't want to be seen again. And so he like literally that's his motivation. It's like the most random motivation. It isn't that he doesn't want to be seen again he's afraid of being killed and for the first time like because the perfect and kind can but what i don't understand is why does a father want to kill him yeah that's the other thing i assume it's supposed to be kind of like a, a kind of like uh christians just think everything that's and then not that the good and kind is christian but it's, it's sort of coded that way or or in in my western reading of it it's sort of coded that way in i'm sure sri lanka has a a long and complicated uh, religious history of violence and uh, oppression and stuff. So they could be referring to something else. I just keep calling it that because it just seems like the um, 
the the way that authors don't like formalized religions but like some kind of vague paganness but that could be a bit of a misreading it's supposed to i think just to have been like oh it's a thing outside of my power i'm a, and it's dark so i assume it's bad so i'm gonna kill it um the thing about it is it's also explained though that the shadow can go everywhere and do everything and that while um uh feta has just kind of hung around the city the shadow has been all around the world like traveling like whoa bro i'm like i know what china looks like i, I i've swum with the dolphins man like that's how it's i'm like what okay and so this is the thing the the, the twist right happens that this whole time we thought this was in third person but actually it's in first person it's the shadow been telling this entire story this whole time and you're like oh that's what i assumed it meant but the thing about it is that the book has been in very standard third person it's not like the book starts in third person and then starts like changing as the book goes on and you're like oh wow this is maybe more omniscient or like it does feel like we're learning things that feta shouldn't know it's just like literally just like snap oh wait i've been here all the time and you're like okay if you've been there all the time then that should have been thrown shown through a gap in the the narrative verse narrative voice versus feta so it should have been one of the things where like the narrative explains something about like a culture and you as the reader are like but feta wouldn't know that so what what viewpoint are we like that's the thing is there it, it's such a fascinating idea to have the story of someone told by their shadow and the ways that those two views could differ um the way the shadow sees the world versus what a, a normal third person narrative would sound like. But um, none of that is done. It's literally just like a, oh, uh, and, and I was a shadow all along. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm going to be the one who who moves the climax of the story. And Feta is just hanging around. And also, wait a second. Also, also, at one point from Shadow's perspective, Feta like spits on somebody's desk and it burns through the papers and desks and i'm really like weird what does that mean that's the other thing is the magic in this book is kind of stupid and like again it's just very undefined which is okay to a certain extent but if everything in your book is very undefined then none of it actually makes sense um and and so i mean we didn't even talk about how the bright doors are like actually supposedly doorways into other realms where oh okay so that was supposed to be one of the themes they're doorways into other realms so like her his dad can like take something inconvenient and just push it into another realm and i think the, the idea is that this is supposed to be a metaphor for how luriat city pushes people it doesn't like out of view like out of sight out of mind but then it would make sense if like one of the devils came back and revenged on the good and kind as a theme but like that's not what happens the shadow isn't a devil so it's like, that's not thematically what happens. So there's this one fan fiction I read one time and it was really cool. It's because um, the concept was, was that this person had a lover and this lover ended up being the bad guy and uh, his whole, okay, so it was Dragon Age. Um, so uh, <laughs> and it was, it was Solus and the Inquisitor. And so if you know the storyline, it's really good. Uh, the point is, is that he becomes successful. He does, the uh, he, he wants to, Go back in time, basically. He wants to rewrite history and right a wrong. And so he goes back in time, but so does she, like, and then that alters current age. And she's in that current, like, but no, no, it, they do go back in time. That is what it is. But in going back in time, it's kind of like a blanket, and then you fold it over. And that entire pocket of all those people who were born during all those years that may not no longer, like that entire universe was erased, right? Well, all of those things are like pollution now and they're like screaming horrendous awful creatures that are polluting the current world there's a really cool concept but the point is is that's basically what i understood these pockets of other universes to be because his mother mentioned that it's every time it's changed now whether or not it's just from the perfect kind or anybody else who had that power doesn't matter but that's what i understood it to be is that each time something's changed like it's all the the the, the people that no longer exist or whatever from those uh, realms. And so they're like ghosts. Why do they look like demons then? That was one thing I didn't understand. So the, their explanation is that the, it's like, think of uh, the doors or however they get to this realm as a membrane. And as they get, they are filtered into a different, like fucked up image of themselves. So kind of like oh, think- Oh, that's interesting. Think like um, Star Trek, and but then the, the atomizer thingy like messes up and like you come the as like- yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
like a, a yes. big jelly creature. So that's the way I pictured it. And I really like that. I think that's a really cool concept. It doesn't belong anywhere in this. It doesn't do anything. And uh, and it's like <laughs> one of the best parts of the book. Well, and the other thing is like, we have explained it in a way that makes sense, but it's never actually quite explained that well in the book. So we're actually kind of assuming a little bit. Um, and the thing is, again, it's a, such a fascinating idea that his father can change timelines and that retroactively changes them. But then those other timelines kind of start to bleed into this yeah. thing. You could play with really cool ideas of like, you know, um, uh, uh, Oceana has always been at war at, with wherever that that whole saying like that could actually be true. Some people could be kind of confused. The one time this plays out interestingly is in the program where um, he meets uh, Feta, which by the way, his name is only Feta so that the shadow can make the I'm unfettered joke at the end, which just oh my God, are you a middle schooler? He meets um, some people who were servants in um, oh, yeah. when he was in this city. And then what happens is that in this case, they're very confused as to why they're in a, they're like, we're not in a prison, we're in a small village. And the guy just kind of looks confused. And the idea is, and Feta is like, okay, maybe what happened is that because the bad thing I did got erased from history, they were sent here during that period, but then um, that got erased, but they're still here. So they had to come up with a different reason for it, or they're not really sure. And like, again, the kind of logical inconsistencies being created in a singular timeline is really fascinating. And a thing magic can do in a way that sci-fi can't because in sci-fi time travel never makes sense. But in fantasy, it can kind of not make sense. Like, like exploring the ways that the could create cracks in the world and different worlds would actually kind of trying to be yeah. into each other would be really like cool. the Marvel, like the, the, the Marvel universe thing, the, uh, multi, universe thing issue um the incursions the incursions it's what they're called also laura b side note so what i understood this to be so laura b says so why when the mother came through at the embassy uh her, his mother comes through a, a bright door and like as her like cool ma like tribal like warrior younger self um what okay anyway so why when the mother came through the embassy was she not a devil she could not interact with them i figured it was because or that she could interact with them i figured it's because the magic she shut up before she died but it's not made clear there's only one line that i think is making this clear and i think it does make it clear for the most part the um her old lover her ex-lover the other woman uh she said and i calibrated it specifically to your mother's calculations and she says that and then uh and then she's the one that engages it. So I assumed that like the, I don't know if this is supposed to be canon, but I assumed that the bright doors can be created basically, or can be harnessed. And that if you know how to navigate it, like you know how to star chart basically, then you can set a course to a specific area. And that's why she was able to do what she did. But none of it makes sense. Like, I don't understand. Like, why didn't mom go over to son? Why, but also like, why, why did they just fuck off? And like, I assume they go back to their own original like place, which is like a beautiful concept, but I don't, that doesn't logically make sense. But if the old lady goes into the, through the door, doesn't she, wouldn't she become a demon on the other's side? Yeah, but again, it might be calibrated. Yeah, the thing is, it's very bullshitty magic. Um, And like, I understand this is not a book that's trying to have a hard magic system and doesn't want to, but like, nothing in this world is is formed everything is formless so it's kind of just annoying and there's no like real internal sense of like consistency not even logic but just consistency with it um and so yeah th this could have been again th the climax of this book is the main character not doing anything and the shadow taking over um and like yeah, that's awful though and like Ugh. it's just so stupid it's not like this has been built up again it's very standard third person it's not third person with like little allusions to the side that make you question quite what's going on or ways where you're like oh my god this whole time that makes sense it's just like oh okay i mean that's kind of interesting um uh, overall, I despised this book. It again didn't enrage me in the way that Song of Achilles did, um, because my rage for Madeline Miller still burns bright and hot. Um, but uh, this book, it's just like it was such a nothing of a book. It was such a waste of everyone's time. Um, and it's <laughs> amazing to me that people thought it was good. It really, I, it's it's like that whole South Park smelling their own farts thing. Like it really does feel like that. Like it's just <laughs> not smart people thinking that a thing that's written in a mode that's smart is therefore smart, but they're not actually smart enough to know it isn't. Like, and, and like, I just, I couldn't find any real explanation for why people thought it was good besides it doesn't do the things a good story does. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't like consider this as something that, I think this should be studied as far as like, 
why it doesn't work but i don't think this is something or like things that are being commented upon like from a cultural perspective you know like the way you would break down in class like oh where are the uh religious cultural historical elements that have influenced this author's writing like that kind of thing that would be great for this as a research paper because obviously there's lots of imprinting from it but like as an actual story story like or anything that like I'm pretty sure the author was going for. I don't think he was successful at. Yeah, again, I th this is the kind of book that I think people hesitate to critique because they think they they don't get it, but they don't want to seem like they're dumb um, by critique by by critiquing the thing. But like, no, I think this is a book that just postures. The thing is, people are very susceptible to just accepting the framing of whatever they're given, and so because this is written in a real literature kind of way, I think people engage with it in a way where they automatically think it's good uh, and it's saying something deep when I don't think it's saying anything deep I think it's just like written in that mode and so therefore people and the thing is because of this podcast I've become so much more um, secure in when Stating I don't understand kind of something yeah. it's the problem of the book yeah like we've we've looked at so many pros that I can look at this and be like the pros aren't that good like there there are much better ways to do this there are cases where there's much better writing out there what's what's happening here is just very poor and again i think people are also just charmed by like oh my god he he's mentioning class <gasps> it must be some deep portrayal and it's like okay but it, it's a book like that needs to be developed beyond like oh the city is fractured through class and race lines that are complex you're not actually tracking the complexity and then you're not saying anything about the complexity it's mm. just abstract the only thing i could uh say that like maybe as far as author's intention goes and for like if people are reading it in like a really like intense um what's the word i'm looking for uh uh you know literature critique kind of way whatever is that like maybe the author or maybe i don't have the framework of was i don't remember who i was telling it to but i was like i mean maybe this is a different story you know how oh oh this is better better explanation have you ever watched southern asian movies um not a lot uh, a few i think so there are a couple of shows and movies i've watched and they're the storytelling uh arcs slash the way stories are told are massively different i don't like it yeah. uh it, it's definitely a culture shock for me and i i wonder if like that's kind of the same thing now now that uh, not to forgive it i'm not saying that what i'm saying is maybe there's something like that going on here and that that's part of the rectification of what could make it more readable to at least in the english language and most western culture right but i think what's interesting is that when you watch those things you notice that and you're probably able to kind of recalibrate and go okay the story is telling itself this way or that way um so for example my sister at one point was trying to learn chinese so we watched a bunch of chinese movies and it's kind of fascinating because chinese actors when they're in um chinese productions there's a very low kind of um expressiveness going on so like even one raised word you're like oh i can't believe she did like the 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 tenor yeah. of everything is like this really yeah. like low simmer that suddenly like little things you really catch but then when you put those actors those exact same actors in hollywood productions all of a sudden they seem kind of like unexpressed out yeah yeah they're unexpressive uh specifically i'm thinking of um oh, what's her face from crouching tiger hidden dragon the the older asian actress mm -hmm, i know i can't in, think of her in name western productions bit. she always feels a little bit muted to muted. me but then in 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 uh, like asian productions i'm always like oh wow she's so subtle and good um and so but the thing is you can kind of acclimate to that over time i didn't feel acclimated to this and that's the other thing is that like i mean i guess if he just wants to intended audience is an interesting idea and maybe this is only meant for other people familiar with sri lankan storytelling to read but my main problem isn't even so much how he wrote it it's more how people are reacting to it receiving yeah and i have not been able to have anyone really explain like why this is good beyond it doesn't do the things a satisfying story would do but no but that's what i mean though is like there is the there is the part of this discussion where it's through the filter of like this being intended for a very different kind of thing but then you can also kind of it's i don't know if i want to compare this because again dante's the inferno is still italian so like it's not Asian. So again, different story structure. So maybe, you know, it still would be different. But Dante, uh, the Inferno, even though it's very like, I mean, it's not really a traditional story, as one might say, uh, it's all metaphor for political stuff and like making statements and stuff. But nonetheless, it's still 
more readable and clear, even though they're in hell. <laughs> no, am I wrong though? Like I've read I one trans. Now, granted, I don't know what the original Italian reads like. I've read, but I've read what my professor said was one of the best translations for what they truly mean. Um, not for the meter and or whatever the cadence of like, but what they literally mean or what he literally meant. Um, but even then, like I followed it, like. I, it was still dreamlike. There were still metaphors and political statements being done and like, like religious uh, comments being made, but it was still like a story, you know? It was like one dude, it was a simple story. It's one dude, another dude, and they're walking through hell. And that's it. And you're just, it's like, it's like a, a going through one of those drive through zoos. Like, that's what it feels like. They're just like, oh yeah. And those people are uh, like reliving their death this way. And if you look to your left. Dante's Inferno though is also written, like you can tell it's an older story written. It's kind of like Beowulf where you're like, Beowulf does not have a super satisfying structure for a uh, modern audience, but you know it's from a different time period for a different on. But that's what audience. I mean though. Like, but, but with this, but Asian stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't have that. Um, and the other thing is, I don't think he's writing in an entirely way for just Sri Lankan people. I'm assuming- I don't think so either, uh, either, excuse me. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't look up interviews with him specifically because I don't like to look up interviews with authors before we do these. I The author is dead. Again, I think it's more, I, I think you should always just engage with the text as it exists. But I'd like to acknowledge that fact for anyone listening is that if that is the case, then that's a completely different reading, but for our experience, for our podcast, this is how we feel. And I'm right, and other people are wrong. Okay, cool, oh my so God, you have so to fun. head out now. I really do um, gotta go now. We will talk to you later. All right, have a good day, bye.